Honorable Minister for Commerce and Industry, Sri Anand Sharma, Siddharth Birla, President-elect, Fiki, Jyotsna Suri, Vice President, Fiki, Didar Singh, Secretary General, Fiki, and the talented team at Fiki, members of the diplomatic corps, senior government officials, members of the Fiki National Executive Committee, colleagues from industry from across India, members of media, ladies and gentlemen. Good morning and welcome to the 86th Annual General Meeting of FICI. The last two years have been particularly difficult for the Indian economy and it is imperative that we get back to the 8 to 9 percent growth mark. As the Finance Minister, Mr. Chidambaram, only in March and frankly from industry we heard this with a sense of relief. He announced in the budget, growth is a necessary condition and we must unhesitatingly embrace growth as the highest goal. It is growth that will lead to inclusive development. Without growth, there will be neither development nor inclusiveness. So what is the impetus of this growth? What drives the Indian economy? And here I'm reminded of a statement that Winston Churchill once made, the empires of the future will be the empires of the mind. His words particularly, I think, resonate now in the age of the knowledge economy. And all of us here are familiar with the way the IT and BPO sectors have grown in India. And in this industry has raised our profile to the global level. It has become our best known strengths, where IT and BPO are pretty much synonymous with what India is seen as. How did this come to be? In fact, Thomas Friedman, the economist, traces it to the 1990s when a combination of India's excess of highly skilled technology workers and an abundance of fiber optics, so infrastructure, converged to give India an edge in the technology market. And he, in fact, cites this as one of those events that flattened the world, creating a more level global economic level playing field. So what is the next disruptive wave for us? Could it be agriculture and food processing? As we are already amongst the largest food processors in the world, the largest milk producers, second largest fruit and vegetable producers. After all, land and water are a scarce resource, and yet our productivity in agriculture as a huge user of these resources is substandard. Or could it be in energy or the water sector as we need to devise innovative solutions in terms of utilization of these twin shortages? Or maybe in the export sector, as China vacates some of this space. We need to look into the future, identify the potential wave beforehand, and build a supportive ecosystem in order to get that next disruptive wave into action. FIKI has prepared vision documents for key sectors, which tell us what the industry should look like in the next 10 to 20 years and what steps we need to take to reach there. We need to work together to achieve this. Now let me now turn to another important segment of our economy, the manufacturing sector. Fiki published the manufacturing handbook four months ago. The government has come out with an agenda also for this sector, but we are far from progressing at the pace we should. What we need essentially is an enabling environment that encourages more investments in the manufacturing sector. I think it's significant here to reflect on what Nelson Mandela said, money won't create success, the freedom to make it will. So these days, we speak about investments and India, and there's a general mood of despondency. We do need to remind ourselves that our consumer market is growing. We are on course to become the fifth largest consumer market in the world by 2025. There's a huge demand for auto, consumer durables, FMCG, pharma, textiles, housing, telecom equipment, and the list can go on as our population gets more prosperous and seeks to fulfill its aspirations. And this explains why many companies from across the world, 
whether GSK, Unilever, PepsiCo, Coca-Cola, Hitachi, Hyundai, Samsung, Toyota, just to name a few, remain committed to the Indian market and see India's attractiveness as an investment destination. And it is no surprise that the highest investments this year are from Unilever, 3.2 billion, and GSK, in fact, just announced another billion dollars over the billion they brought in in January. So these companies all know India well and therefore see the opportunity. In fact, not all of you may know, the latest global Ernst & Young survey ranks India as the most attractive investment destination followed by Brazil and China. In terms of investments, USA, France, and Japan are the top three investors most likely to invest in India, according to this survey. The sectors most likely to attract deals include auto, technology, life sciences, and consumer products. And this was across a slew of Fortune 500 companies. There are a number of other factors that impact India's economic fortunes, including our relationship with other countries. The dynamics in Asia, for instance, are changing. Japan is actively investing in India, and India has repeatedly come up as a preferred choice for Japanese multinationals. China and India, too, are finding more and more ways to collaborate, as the recent visit of our Prime Minister to China highlighted. We are deepening our connects with countries of the ASEAN region, as well as the BRICS countries. The work being done by FIKI as part of institutional arrangements, arrangements like the India ASEAN Business Council and the BRICS Business Council highlight the development of different groupings where India is the key player. And we have all seen how critical India was in the WTO deliberations in Bali, so ably led by Minister Sharma. Now, another key driver for growth is innovation. And this does not only reside in the high-end R&D labs of large corporates. So let's take the case of a well-known story, the Dabbawalas. This simple service, familiar to all of us in Mumbai, is a model of efficiency and efficacy and actually of the Indian work ethos. One of the keys to the system's success, in fact, is a code of colored symbols which has been learned and memorized by what is largely an illiterate Dabbawala force. And the system is astoundingly accurate so accurate that the Forbes magazine awarded them a Six Sigma rating, an accuracy of 99.9999%. This translates only into one missing dabba per six million delivered. If this sounds a bit familiar as a business model, one dabbawala explained to a reporter, there is a service called FedEx that is similar to ours, but they don't deliver lunch. Yeah? So, so what I think this illustrates is how Indian business innovates, makes extraordinary use of available resources and commodities. And the philosophy which is best enshrined in the words of Tagore, as you know, India's first, first Nobel laureate in literature, if I can't make it through one door, I'll go through another door, or I'll make a door. A little like the Delhi driver. So, so we can see the effects of innovation on accessibility. The world's lowest telecom costs resulted in increased cellular phone use. World's cheapest car, or let's say value car, Tata's Nano, made headlines around the globe and is seen as a turning point in the global auto industry. The benefits of business innovation permeate all levels of Indian society. So here again, we need to ensure that we create and maintain and grow the enabling environment so that this can facilitate employment opportunities, directly or indirectly. So just in healthcare, I was think, looking at what are the innovations we have, and just taking one industry, let alone all the others. If you look at this, Jaipur Foot, recognized by Time magazine in 2009, is one of the world's 50 best innovations. 99% of the patients are below the poverty line. Or Arvind Eye Care, which delivers cataract operations and one-sixth of the cost of an Indian hospital, one-thirtieth of the cost of a USA hospital. In 2003, they became the single largest cataract surgery provider in the world. In 2003, Onarayan Hrudale, 
which has perfected a low-cost approach to heart surgery at half the cost of an Indian hospital, one sixteenth the cost in the U.S. Forbes has just listed India as the 39th in uh, innovation among 145 countries. So we rank pretty high, something to be proud of. FIKI has highlighted solutions across industries earlier this year when we partnered with the Ministry of Finance to organize a seminar on the theme Innovation for Inclusion during the 46th annual meeting of the Board of Governors of ADB that India hosted. And our flagship Millennium Alliance project with USAID and the Department of Science and Technology Government of India has been a great success, helped in bringing to the fore solutions aimed at addressing India's development challenges. Now let me now touch upon some of the key economic challenges that have been bothering us for a while now. Inflation. We have seen this has been a perennial problem for the last three years. Food inflation particularly has been very high, driving up overall price levels. RBI has been proactive in ensuring that the situation does not go out of hand. However, a tight monetary policy stance has led to high interest rates, something Fiki has been speaking up a lot about. And this has adversely impacted industrial growth and the investment cycle in the country. Additionally, our companies clearly operate in an environment where considerable time and resources are spent on dealing with regulations. And this was acknowledged just yesterday in the panel of secretaries that addressed us. All of us know that in terms of ease of doing business, India ranks 134 out of 189 countries as per World Bank on certain standard parameters. So procedural reforms are as important, if not more important, than policy reform. Our businesses are expanding, but imagine how well they could do if the ease of process of setting up or indeed running day-to-day -day business were better. If we could unleash the entrepreneurial spirit I just talked about among professionals so that people with ideas and vision could follow their dreams. It was also therefore important for us to address this. There is of course the problem of infrastructure, huge deficit here and a huge area for us to focus on. And we are, of course, today engaged in developing some very large and ambitious projects like, like DMIC. And I must congratulate Minister for staying on the course to ensure that large projects such as these corridors, the Delhi-Mumbai Industrial Corridor and others come into place, because these will provide the building blocks for our growth in the future. At FIKI, we have evolved a comprehensive economic agenda that touches upon some of these issues and which the minister will be releasing in a short while from now. While I will not go into the details here, I'd like to flag a few priorities. First, dealing with food inflation, which calls for a quantum jump in food productivity, straightening out the kinks in agri-supply and distribution, reducing wastage, we need to have a second green revolution that focuses on fruit and vegetables, meat, fish, eggs, milk, milk products. We need an effective coal chain and warehousing infrastructure. Second, for reducing the cost of doing business in India and in fact enhancing government revenue too, we must usher in a comprehensive goods and service tax. We need one common market in India. Third, speedier implementation of infrastructure projects. And while the CCI, the Cabinet Committee of Investments, has done a commendable job in clearing large projects, we need to now see that these go into production. Fourth, the administration of the tax system in the country requires a mindset change. As long as actions are driven by a single point agenda of maximizing revenue today, we will sacrifice revenue tomorrow. We will always be drawn towards litigation. We need to bridge the gap between interpretation and intent of law. We need clearer laws. Over 70% of litigation cases in India involve the government as either a petitioner or a respondent. This, in effect, makes government the largest litigant in the country. This situation must change. Fifth, the issue of energy security, where we are actually making some progress. We must follow on our diversification strategy in terms of sources of energy as well as the geographies from where we source these. We need to accept the fact that coal will be the mainstay of our energy mix, 
and in the foreseeable future, we therefore need to evolve policies that help us tap this resource, not shut it off completely as we had done. Sixth, land is essential for industrial expansion and our land-related policies should ensure that this resource is available to industry on a long-term basis and with certainty. Seventh, allocation of natural resources, which has been the subject of intense discussion. The Supreme Court ruling, in fact, mentions that auction cannot be the only mechanism, although it's a preferred mechanism. Fiki believes the process of allocation of natural resources should be transparent, predictable, and there should be a justifiable balance between revenue optimization and socioeconomic development objectives. The rules then need to be followed, action taken promptly when rules are broken. We need regulatory frameworks which look into the long-term profitability of the industry while protecting consumer interests. Eighth, businesses require an environment of predictability that can only be ensured if there is sanctity of contract stability in the tax regime, and applicability of legislations prospectively. There have, as we all know, developments in the past when one or more of these principles has been violated. Government has taken corrective measures in some of the cases, but one must recognize that bringing confidence back can be a long, drawn-out process. Our businesses have a long history of engagement with communities around them and many understand what is good for the community, is good for business. Entrepreneurs, therefore, need to be treated fairly and with respect. We should be part of the collective effort involving both the government and civil society that is aimed at realizing the true potential of India. So at FIKI, we've set up the Inclusive Governance Council to address some of these issues and bring government, industry, and civil society onto a common platform. And some of our members of this council are here with us today. We reaffirm our commitment to work with the government and civil society to ensure that we always adhere to the highest standards of corporate citizenship. As you are aware, FIKI's foundation was built on the tenet of trusteeship. And we draw our inspiration from Gandhiji, at whose instance FIKI was set up. He called upon our founding fathers to set up the federation to make Indian entrepreneurs an integral part of our struggle for economic freedom as a country. We need to work together, find solutions through balance and compromise. Finally, before I come to the close of my address, I'd like to point out that while it is necessary to address the structural and economic problems that we face, it is important to recognize that there are social issues that have to be dealt with as well. We need to work to protect the pluralism that is India, to ensure an inclusive India in all we do. I would particularly like to highlight the role of women in society and business. We need to embrace the cause of the safety of women at the workplace. I hope that all of you that run businesses have introduced the guidelines that we had issued earlier this year into your companies in this regard. Let me also ask, are your daughters as eligible as your sons to run your businesses? May the best person succeed, man or woman. As I come to the close of my presidency at FIKI, I would like to thank Sid and Jyotsna for your support. I also express my gratitude to all the chairs and co-chairs of FIKI's several committees for the tremendous work you are doing in your respective areas. And of course, a special thanks is due to all my colleagues in the FIKI Secretariat, so ably led by our Secretary General, Didar Singh. May you take FIKI to greater heights with your commitment and efforts. To quote from an old Sanskrit shlok, and I end here, Maha Stavira Sangarakshita. To know what we do not know is the beginning of wisdom. I do not know what the future holds for us. 
I do not know what the elections next year mean for us. Yeah. What I do know is the trajectory is ours to make. Thank you.